here are four uh, significant permanent changes in neurobiology that are found in human beings and a number of animals that have been uh, researched who've had early neglect. Okay, the first one is a persistent increase in CRF. Well, we already talked about this, okay? But let me reiterate that uh, in addition, I won't go to all these uh, things on the slide at this point, but in addition to creating an enormous amount of anxiety, it really, keep this in mind, okay, interferes with the ability to go into slow wave sleep, also more commonly known as deep sleep. Uh, CRF and suicide victims. Look at this, increased CRF producing cells in people that have successfully committed suicide, and you find these in the, what, hypothalamus, okay? Increased levels uh, of CRF in spinal fluid. Again, these are uh, post-mortem evaluation. They have high levels in spinal fluid, and the, the frontal lobes uh, need to be receptive to CRF receptors in order to exercise top-down control, and they actually have fewer than normal receptors for CRF in the frontal lobes. Okay, now we're going to look at another video here. And then once again, actually I'm here. Okay, once again, let me know if there's any problem in Fresno about being able to hear this. So let's see. One trial learning, John. Okay, all right, here we go. All right. of the stress hormone cortisol in the brains of these abandoned organs. It shows how early neglect makes the brain produce more cortisol when stressed throughout life, making for long-term coping difficulties. It's not just the direct effects of cortisol, but it's also <coughs> that those same kind of stressful events are going to affect children's memories, children's emotional status. And so you have these kind of stressful events working in many levels of the nervous system and actually potentiating each other in some sense. Okay, now, go back to the slides for just, just a moment here. You notice, that obviously, the rocking behavior in these orphans. And these were uh, kids that were in the Romanian orphanages, some of the, probably the most severely uh, affected children uh, on earth because of the things that they experienced. Uh, but the rocking behavior, well, we also saw rocking behavior occurring in, in the monkey, right? Harry Harlow's studies. And what's this about? I'll have a slide later that goes into more detail, but the cerebellum in the back of the brain, okay, small brain structure you know about, uh, is very sensitive to movement, and it's a part of what helps to maintain balance. Uh, movement in space, and, and especially repetitive movements, and what's been found is that rocking behavior, whether it's the kid doing it himself or the monkey doing it, uh, or it's a parent rocking their baby, it's calming to them. And there's a particular part of the cerebellum that gets activated by this kind of movement and it results in what they saw, what we saw in the earlier film today, and that is the, the release of beta endorphin directly into the brainstem and some of these brainstem areas that are responsible for creating anxiety. So this is a common uh, kind of self-soothing behavior. And you'll also see this in uh, people who, for instance, have a, just in the immediate aftermath some horrible, like fire or uh, bad car wreck or something. You'll see adults, for instance, uh, and kids like rocking back and forth. So it, it's probably nobody does this intentionally, but if you do that, it, it begins to turn the volume down just a little bit, okay, uh, on the stress response. All right. Now, I want to talk next about some studies that I think are very fascinating, and uh, these are done by Charles Nimroff at Emory University, and uh, they, they we have actually have a rat here. He used mice, but uh, what he did is, is he took mice and they had uh, newborn. Okay, in the litter they might have four uh, or five born into the litter, and what they did is uh, they they did experimental technique where they went in at day 10 after birth and they would have like two of the identified mice uh, out of the litter who then were removed from their mother for six hours a day. Now mice and rats alike when they're born they, they nurse for about three weeks and then they're weaned okay so uh, this is 10 days into uh, their life 
they're taken away from their mother for six hours a day. Now, the other 18 hours a day, they're back with mom, but this is six hours. And what they did is they took these uh, little animals and put them in an incubator. And so they kept them very warm, and it was, uh, well, they determined how much food that they normally would eat during that, that period of time, and they fed them uh, milk at that time. So they, they were warm enough, and they got enough food. But the problem is they didn't have their mom. And go back to the Discovery Channel video that we saw. Uh, what you see in mammals, is uh, in rodents, for instance, and dogs and cats, a lot of licking behavior, okay? And these moms lick sort of round the clock. In large mammals, like elephants, actually the mom will take her trunk and kind of massage her little babies. This is tactile stimulation. Now, what happened was that... Uh, they would, after six days in a row of uh, being deprived of mom for six hours, then they're back with mom full time for another few days and then they're weaned. And what happened then is they followed these mice for the rest of their life. And let's go back here uh, for just a minute to this, to this slide. These animals showed then these persistent neurobiological abnormalities for a lifetime. Now, the, one interesting thing about this is they decided to do the same study again, but change it a little bit. And what they did in the second study is the same kind of paradigm, except this time when the, uh, the animals were in the incubator, they had trained graduate students to become infant mouse massage therapists. And what they did is they gave them a little paintbrush that had soft bristles, and they had already determined how frequently the, the mom would normally lick a baby. And also, for some reason, the belly gets licked more than other parts of the, uh, uh, of the animal. And so the graduate students, during this period of six hours, uh, would take turns massaging the little babies uh, in a fashion very similar to what mom would do. And then they went back to their mom full time and were weaned. And guess what? Through the rest of their entire life, absolutely normal neurobiology. Very, very compelling research to suggest that there's something about tactile stimulation that is critical, a, a stimulus that helps to facilitate the later developing aspects of the circuitry and brain structures for two things. One is affect regulation, and the other is for attachment, okay? So uh, let's take a look at two more videos, okay? Like people, animals have different parenting styles. Some rats, for example, lick their pups much more than others do. This difference in caregiving causes measurable impact on the pup's developing brain. Now what we believe on the basis of our work is that individual differences in parental care actually give rise to differences in the way kids ultimately respond to stress. Neurobiologist Michael Meaney measures changes in brain chemistry when there are differences in grooming and touching. His researchers at Montreal's Douglas Hospital isolate the gene in the brain producing the stress hormone corticotropin-releasing factor, CRF. The offspring that receive more of this liquid grooming, this tactile stimulation, are the animals who show much more modest response to stress. For the animals who were modestly neglected and received less tactile stimulation, the gene which produces corticotropin releasing factor is more active. There are greater stores of this chemical in the brain. And so when a stressor comes along and hits the system, it drives a greater hormonal, cardiovascular, behavioral, and emotional response to that stressor. Okay, now, you can just leave it like it is. I'm going to go back to another video here in just a minute. But this begs a question, and that is, okay, if you can come back in and artificially sort of uh, supplement tactile stimulation uh, and, and it normalizes the uh, brain development, is it possible, though, that doing even more of the, uh, you know, licking them with the brush sort of thing could, in fact, make a big difference? And the answer to that is, you betcha. And so they did studies where they took rats and they actually gave them more stimulation. The most reliable way to do this is the researcher comes into the laboratory and each morning the two uh, rats or mice in the study uh, that are the experimental 
ones, uh, they're identified, so they're same ra same rats or mice same every day. They go in and they touch them on the head for just a moment, and then what would happen is the mothers then would spend almost twice the amount of time licking those guys than the rest of her litter. And the, the, the you know the, the hunch is here that this is probably because they're trying to get rid of this foul human stench. But anyway, uh, what happens is these these mice and rats get more of it, and guess what? Later on, you experiment with them, you uh, subject them to stressors, and they are highly stress resistant. Okay, let's look at another video here. Oops. So we reduce stress, but whether or not we can teach kids to handle stress. Barr also examined the effect carrying an infant has on a child's ability to cope with stress. He asked one group of Montreal parents to increase the amount of time they carried their infants to four hours a day, while another group didn't change their practice of carrying their infants about two hours a day. To our amazement, the infants that were carried more, what we refer to as the supplemental carrying group, actually reduced the amount of crying they did in the first three months of life at six weeks of age by about 46%. Clearly, the carrying that the mothers did was an important contributor to them <coughs> being able to regulate that crying and to cry less. Okay, turn the light back on. <coughs> Okay, now I want to talk about something uh, that I think is a really big deal, and that is if you look at, and studies have been done to evaluate this, how long are babies typically held, rocked, uh, you know, having that kind of tactile stimulation, closeness with mom or somebody else, how, how many hours a day is the norm? And if you go cross-culturally, the norm is four hours a day, except in the United States, Canada and several Western European countries where, like on the film, uh, the typical uh, situation is, is moms are holding these babies two hours a day. So it's really out of sync with, uh, you know, with the rest of the world. Now, in addition, if you think about, uh, think about early humans and you look and see the currently still existing hunter-gatherers, a few isolated uh, tribes of uh, uh, people to do this. Uh, the mothers carry the babies all the day, day long. They're out hunting or gathering food and that kind of stuff. So having close physical contact is a very big deal. So what Ron Barr did then in his study is he had the two groups, right? And they just, one group went out and they kept a diary and sure enough, on average, holding them two hours a day. And the uh, other group, they intentionally, by, uh, by design, held the baby for at least four hours a day. It could be mom, it also could be dad or somebody else doing it. And you see what the difference is. Now, I think a couple of things here, and again, let me give an editorial kind of discussion about this. First off, why is this happening? How come uh, babies in, in our country and some of these other countries are only being held for two hours a day? Well, I think the answer is because of lifestyle choices. And I, I am absolutely, completely in favor of, of, you know, equal opportunities for men and women alike. The cultural standard has been that moms get the, the duty of doing this. There's no data that suggests that this can't be done by dad uh, or by, you know, an aunt or somebody else. And I think the, the single most important thing we could do in terms of having a positive impact on mental health is have public service ads run every night if, if necessary just telling new parents you've got to hold your babies because what's happening is that uh, a lot of these kids aren't being held and then we end up as therapists having to kind of clean up the mess of, of these poor people that have launched into their life with really impaired abilities for, for controlling emotions and being highly likely to have depression or severe personality disorders. So that's my editorial comment. <clears throat>